the Jerusalem Channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. That prophecy of Ezekiel has become reality in our generation. The story of Israel is part of the ministry of the Jerusalem Channel. On this historic 70th anniversary of the rebirth of Israel, please consider making a special gift to continue our media ministry through our website, the Jerusalem Channel app, or by mail. Where are the prayer intercessors in the 21st century? Our times are in desperate need of real prayer. And at our website each week, we post top-notch prayer pointers from Intercessors for Israel and other sources. However, I've noticed that catchy photos and snappy quotes are shared much more often than the vital prayer points because sadly, Believers who are genuinely praying are in the minority. Yet it only takes one dedicated, sold-out intercessor to move the hand of God. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg. The Lord taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The purpose of our prayers is to believe that the will of God is done here on earth as it is in heaven. In prayer, we bring His kingdom authority to bear on our situations and our governments. But it's sadly alarming to me that the prayer pointers that we post every week at our website are not shared half as much as other items that may seem more exciting. Yet it's prayer, real, genuine prayer, that's desperately needed more than ever, especially as we see so many end-time prophecies coming to pass right before our eyes. Through the years, I've talked much about the necessity of intercession, and in Ezekiel 22:30, God said that I search for a man who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one. You see, God constantly seeks for intercessors who will endeavor by their prayer exploits to stop the cycle and consequences of national sins. He seeks for somebody to stand in the gap where the wall of protection has been broken down by sin and corruption. God wants an intercessor for the land that he shouldn't have to bring judgments against it. The commentaries explain that the Lord will enter as judge through the gaps eroded by sin, and he will come in as a man of war to destroy transgressors, unless an intercessory prayer warrior, should present himself to the Lord on the behalf of the people, to intercede and to seek mercy for them, to interpose himself between God and the people, and act the part of an intercessor, to pray for them as Moses interceded for Israel, preventing God from destroying them in his wrath. You see, this generation has focused so much on the love of God that the other side of the coin, the wrath of God, is not understood or taught. Balance is needed. And Psalm 106, verse 23, is a commentary on these scriptures. That verse says, Moses stepped in between the Lord and the people. He begged God to turn from his anger and not destroy them. But God says in Ezekiel, I found none. I found no reformer. I found no repairer of the breach no restorer of paths to dwell in. I found no intercessor like Abraham was for Sodom, as Moses was for Israel. 
God said, I found nobody like Aaron who stood between the living and the dead to stop the deadly plague brought on by the people's rebellion and insolence. In Numbers chapter 16, we read that Aaron, the high priest, ran into the midst of the assembly when a plague had begun among the people. He took a censer and incense and made atonement for the people. Aaron took his stand between the dead and the living, and the plague was checked. So God is saying that he seeks selfless intercessors like that, but he couldn't find anybody. You see, a faithful prophet who tries to get the people to return to God has always been a scarce commodity. But we're trying to broadcast today far and wide that the influence of one man, the influence of one woman, can be enormous. The influence of great men and women of God have literally changed the world. One man may save a nation or plunge it into hell. Think of Paul on board a wrecked ship. He obtained the lives of all the crew through his prayers. The intercession, as I said, of Moses saved the Hebrew nation. And for King David's sake, God conferred large favors on the nation. The Wesley brothers literally revolutionized England. And I want today to mention four kinds of prayer that were listed by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And all four types of prayers are mentioned in the plural, meaning that they're inexhaustible. Paul wrote, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and for all who are in authority. Why? He said, so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and honesty. For this, he said, is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, concerning his watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem, God says in the marvelous chapter of Isaiah 62, that we shall never hold our peace, we'll never be silent day or night. And verse six explains why. It says, you who are the Lord's remembrancers, in other words, you who are the Lord's secretaries, take no rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord's remembrancers is the literal translation of the Hebrew of Isaiah 62, 6. It says that he set watchmen on these walls and that you who are the Lord's remembrancers should give him no rest and take no rest until he makes Jerusalem, God's city, a praise in the earth. And this is the secret of intercession. After all, why do we need to pray to remind the Lord of his will or to remind him of his purposes in his word? Isn't it superfluous that we should act like the Lord's secretaries, reminding him of his appointments? After all, he's God. Yet many of the great Bible teachers in my life, like Watchman Nee, Derek Prince, Reinhard Bonke, and Lance Lambert, who were all intercessors, they all pointed out this truth that God desires us to be his co-workers, to gather with him. And so God's training us through prayer for greater service throughout eternity. Well, the commentaries have made many attempts to distinguish between the four types of prayers that Paul mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The first aspect of prayer is the word he used that's translated supplications, meaning primarily a need. And many English versions of the Bible use the word supplications, but the New American Standard Bible renders the word entreaties. But the word primarily means a need, entreating or beseeching God concerning a specific need. This is not just asking something from God. It's an apparent earnest appeal or beseeching of the Lord. It's because of a need that there's an inquiry of the Lord, an earnest beseeching of him that he would reveal his mind concerning a matter. 
This is why Lance Lambert of Blessed Memory here in Jerusalem taught us that supplications are so important to be sure that we're praying the actual mind of the Lord on a matter. And so we can expect definite answers. Otherwise, if we don't discern the Lord's mind, we're just threshing around in prayer and getting nowhere. Well, as an intercessor on the walls, when I think of supplications, the verse that immediately comes to mind is a scripture that we pray in Jerusalem all the time. It's a future event mentioned in Zechariah 12, 10, where God promises to pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, plural. God is speaking in this verse and says, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And by faith, we're living in this verse and praying it into being as God's remembrancers. This verse promises that the Holy Spirit will produce in Jerusalem a gracious disposition towards prayer, an inclination among the inhabitants to supplicate, to make entreaties of God. In Hebrew, grace and supplications are kindred words, meaning gracious supplications. And the plural implies that there will be prayers without ceasing in the future here in God's city, because it's going to be a great outpouring. The verb to pour implies an abundance of the spirit of grace and supplications. This great outpouring, this great revival will produce a national repentance for the way the people have grieved and offended God. They will look upon the stricken Messiah whose hands and feet were pierced and whose side was pierced with a spear. This looking upon, God says, me whom they have pierced began 2,000 years ago when bystanders at the cross smote their breasts. And this looking shall continue in the last days until all of the remnant of this nation is saved. Realizing that Jesus, Yeshua is his Hebrew name, was pierced and wounded for all of our sins, they will look to him by faith for forgiveness and summons him to return. In fact, Ezekiel 36 prophesies about the return of Israel to their land in the last days and their redemption. But verse 37 says, God will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. He's looking for supplications. For although God has promised to perform it, yet he expects his people to apply to him for it. And so it's our duty as intercessors, as watchmen on these walls, to put the Lord in remembrance of his promises, to plead them before him, and to pray to him for the fulfillment of all of his divine appointments. God said, I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That means the leaders and the people alike. God himself names Jerusalem, by the way, as the capital and representative of this nation. And so from the head of the nation, the holy unction will flow down with the spirit of grace and of supplications. Hallelujah. Now, the second kind of prayer mentioned in 1 Timothy 2 is translated by the English word meaning prayers, meaning literally a pouring out of one's soul. This is the most frequently used word in the New Testament for prayer. One definition of prayer is wishes and desires directed and expressed to God for things that are in themselves to be desired of God, either for ourselves or others. And so in our prayer meetings in Jerusalem, it's so very vital to declare over our prayer time that Jesus is Lord and that everything we pray will be spirit led so that we can hit the target of the burden of the Lord at that hour of prayer. We must pray the things that he most wants prayed into the earth. And so we have to learn to assess by the Holy Spirit the topics to pray. Many times the Lord will bring up a topic for us to pray at different angles. And then the Lord will say either it's done or he'll say that's enough prayer for now, but we'll take up this matter again later until the answer comes. 
Sometimes a person will introduce a prayer topic, but it's not spirit led. And so if you recognize that the anointing of the spirit is not upon a prayer, for example, if it's a sermonette instead of a prayer, it's vital to recover the flow of the Holy Spirit. Those who are in charge of the prayer meeting must gently steer and correct and keep the prayers on track and also try to encourage those who are praying in the flow and in the unction of the Holy Spirit. I also want to say that praying and watching go together. You see, it's not just enough to pray. Jesus said to watch what's going on and pray. The Apostle Paul also encouraged us all to watch. In Ephesians 6, 18, Paul wrote, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful with all perseverance and supplication for all the God's people. And so we have to watch the news and watch what's going on with the leaders in the churches and so forth. And the Greek word for watching in the Bible means simply to keep alert, to stay awake. Also, the Hebrew word to watch, shomer, also it means to guard and to watch over. So as Shomrim, as watchmen upon these walls, we're like security guards to guard the interests of the Lord. In fact, a time of corporate prayer is like a military operation. We're in spiritual warfare, but our weapons are not flesh and blood. They are mighty through God to pull down satanic strongholds. And so we must learn how to send this weapon, the word of God, the Holy Spirit supplies to us as a sword of the spirit to focus upon our prayer targets. You see, the two major aspects of prayer targets in these last days is watching over the work of the Lord concerning the Great Commission, as well as the restoration of the nation of Israel. Concerning the Great Commission in Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Concerning these weighty matters, there are seemingly impossible situations, visa situations and difficulties that confront the Lord's work that must be ironed out in prayer, knowing that nothing is impossible concerning finances and so forth, if we're believers and not doubters. But as if it's not enough to pray for the Lord to open cities and nations to the gospel, we're also called as watchmen to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's absolutely astounding to me in this Israel's 70th year of being a nation, once again, after such incredible odds, that many men in the churches don't understand what God is doing in restoring Israel prior to the second coming of Jesus. And many are even dangerously opposing and boycotting God's restoration of the Jews. It's one thing for unbelievers not to understand what's going on, but for leaders in the churches who should know this Bible not to understand is especially grievous and demands much prayer. Jesus told his disciples to learn the parable of the fig tree that represents the nation of Israel. Today, despite its withering in the past, the fig tree representing the nation of Israel has miraculously blossomed once again. The root was withered, but it was never removed from the land. The fig tree lives again, and we're called to watch and pray and to guard God's purposes when all hell including the United Nations, comes against the Lord's eternal purposes concerning Israel. And I found that praying Psalm 2 is especially effective along these lines. In fact, our weapons in prayer are the authoritative name of Jesus and the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. So whenever the Lord gives you a scripture verse or a passage of His Word, it can be more valuable to proclaim his promises, than just our own mere words. This is because the Word of God itself is powerful. And when we send it in the atmosphere, out in prayer, it will accomplish wonders. And by the way, don't feel that you have to pray a lot of words after you proclaim a scripture verse. And if you're praying corporately, participating in a prayer meeting, 
Be sure not to read an entire chapter. Sermonettes during prayers are called horizontal praying, meaning that you're not talking vertically to God. And reading entire chapters just kills the atmosphere of a genuine prayer meeting. Well, you may still be thinking, surely God can fulfill his purposes and his holy will without us. In fact, without us, he would do much better because there would be no mistakes. However, God is training us to rule with Jesus when the Lord returns. We're being trained for time and eternity. And so we must learn to discern the will of God and to obey it. God's wanting to educate us. And Jesus told his followers that he's given us the keys of the kingdom. And when we use the keys of the kingdom, we are in effect possessing a situation in the name of the Lord and declaring the will of God over a situation. And we're taking executive action on behalf of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, the third type of prayer Paul called intercessions. This word has the idea of petitioning a superior or someone with authority on behalf of others. And so we seek an audience with God on behalf of others or on behalf of a situation that needs desperate attention. We have to know, of course, the mind of the Lord. I often think of how the great Welsh coal miner and missionary to Africa, the intercessor known as Rhys Howells, was taught by the Holy Spirit how to intercede on behalf of others. In the school of prayer, he first learned to intercede for souls to be saved. And then he learned about intercession for healing. And then he progressed to intercede for entire people groups. For example, he interceded for Indian widows to be saved from the funeral pyres of their dead husbands. And the law was changed in India. He got the mind of the Lord to start a home for Jewish orphans during World War II and to keep Hitler out of Britain through intercessory prayer at his Bible college. General Charles Gordon was a British military leader who became governor general of the Sudan, where he accomplished much to suppress revolts and to suppress the local slave trade. During a career break, he visited the Holy Land and explored the biblical sites. Gordon's interest was prompted by his deep religious beliefs because he had become an evangelical Christian in 1854. While in Jerusalem, Gordon lived at the American Colony, which was a great prayer center. After his visit, Gordon suggested a different location for Golgotha, the site of the Lord's crucifixion, now known as the Garden Tomb. And sometimes it's still referred to as Gordon's Calvary. Well, this great man, General Gordon, knew the power of intercessory prayer. And thankfully, he knew intercessors who could pray for him the right way. Before he was posted to the Sudan, he wrote a letter to a group of British intercessors who met in a house meeting, saying that he would rather have the prayers of that little company gathered only in a house, not in a cathedral, but there in a house. He'd rather have their prayers than all the wealth of the Sudan placed at his disposal. He wrote, pray for me that I may have humility and the guidance of God and that all the spirit of murmuring may be rebuked in me. He later sent another message offering thanks for the next prayer meeting saying that he was carried by the intercessions of those believers and that he was calmly resting in the current of God's will. And so he gave thanksgiving. And indeed, thanksgiving is the fourth type of prayer mentioned in 1 Timothy 2. Prayer with praise, worship, and giving of thanks. Often, this aspect is overlooked or sadly forgotten. Philippians 4.16 exhorts, With thanksgivings let your requests be made known unto God. Thanks not only for answered prayer, but by faith, let's give thanks for answers yet to come. Lord, sometimes I feel depressed, but by faith, I thank you that you are my glory and the lifter up of my head. Your throne is unshakable. And I acknowledge that you're in control of every aspect of my life. And so in using the keys of the kingdom, 
We not only discern and declare the will of God into situations, and we not only possess the situation in his name and take it for the Lord, but we also by faith start to praise and worship the Lord with thanksgiving for the answer and for the victory that's assured. We know the answer is decreed in heaven, and so we thank God for it while we watch for the answer to manifest on earth. And so let's continually open our hearts to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We need continually to be filled by him so that we can be full of faith and so that our faith won't fail and so that we'll be full of the Lord's wisdom, discernment, and grace. The more we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the more executive action we can take in prayer on behalf of the Lord. And so don't forget that the way to victory is often simply to praise the Lord in the midst of our battles. You see, in the Hebrew Bible, King Jehoshaphat ordered the temple choir to be the army's vanguard. And so as they sang, the mercy of the Lord endures forever. God dispatched angelic hosts who ambushed the enemy for them. That was the spirit of faith. And we must continually cultivate the spirit of faith because our minds are often beset with doubts. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 5, one of my favorite verses, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Well, in the School of Prayer in Jerusalem, we learned a lot about corporate prayer, which is so different from praying alone with God as an individual. In corporate prayer, when we're praying together with others, there's great power of agreement and unity. In his book, My House Shall Be Called a House of Prayer, Lance Lambert wrote that the key to corporate prayer is mutuality or togetherness in unity, having the mind of the Lord. He wrote that the seconding of one another's prayers is vitally important. What does it mean to second a prayer? Well, when you hear the anointing being prayed in a prayer meeting, when you recognize clarity and genuine authority in a prayer, don't think that it's necessarily time to move on to another topic. The burden of the Lord may not have been fully discharged in prayer, and it's of paramount importance that the anointed prayer be seconded by saying amen, because that's what the prayer of agreement is all about. By seconding another believer's prayer, we're saying amen. And the word amen comes from the Hebrew root meaning to believe, to have faith. And so when you say amen, you are affirming and you're confirming a person's prayer. You're saying amen, I have faith for that. Well, this subject of prayer is surely inexhaustible. So hopefully we'll take it up again soon. But just know this, without the Lord, we can do no good thing. But with him, we can do exploits. And that's why Daniel 11:32 says that the people who know God will be strong and carry out exploits, will do the works of the Lord. So I always want to be a source of encouragement to you and feel free to stay in contact through the social media or at our website at exploits.tv where you can receive our weekly updates and color exploits magazines. And by the way, don't forget to download our Jerusalem Channel app. And so until next time, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. Maranatha. I'm Christine Dark. Shalom.